Self-acceptance is something that I struggle with, still, still do struggle with, um, even as I've gone through the therapy for a few years. Um, I like to think that I've fully accepted myself as a person who stutters and that I'm okay stuttering and talking about it all the time. But there are still times and people who I don't want to know I stutter and don't know I stutter. Um, so I, I think until I've reached that point where I'm 100% okay with it in all situations, no matter what, then I haven't fully accepted myself as a person who stutters. What is something you might have to do in order to get there? What do you think about when you think about that work ahead of you? It's generally, a, a sort of thought that I have, a negative thought that I have, is that people aren't going to like me because I stutter or think that I'm awkward or weird. Um, and until I realize that it's not who I am and people are going to like me or not like me for who I am, not because I stutter, um, until I accept that fully, then I don't think I'll be able to fully accept myself. I think self-acceptance is an evolving d d destination. Like there are, like I definitely got to a point of self-acceptance, but I could definitely get deeper into self-acceptance. Like I definitely am like very thankful now to be a, a person who stutters and I think that's a blessing, but I definitely still struggle from time to time where I get caught up in moments of fluency and then a disfluency happens and all of a sudden I have like this internal panic of like, oh no, mm -hmm. like what, what's, what's going to happen? Like who am I? Like what are these people going to think? And then it takes me like a few seconds to sort of rebound and be like, oh right, this is who I am and actually I'm glad this happened. Like again, I think it's like, really a cool like bonding uh, opportunity when, when people realize that, that you stutter. I think it's kind of not just self-acceptance, but also self-knowledge. Because I was reading this book, uh, I think it's called War or something, but it was, it was about soldiers and, and Frank probably knows more about this than I do, but I was saying that, you know, if you've got a soldier and they're doing this hike, whatever, the first time they think I can't go on or I can't do it, they're nowhere near the limit of what they can do. And I think my problem with stuttering was I underestimated myself and I didn't realize that I had a lot more strength than I thought. And I thought my limit was a lot less than it was. And so I, my problem was I wasn't willing to go far enough. I was stopping at a certain point and saying, I am not strong enough to do that. And once you start doing it, you realize you are strong enough to do it. And also, it's not as bad as you thought it was going to be. But when you, when you first get to the limit and you say you can't go on, you can go on. You can go past that. And so for me, it almost wasn't as much self-acceptance. It's just self-knowledge. Just being able to understand myself better in that way. Public speaking is, was a big one. That was probably the number one reason why I started speech therapy. And the thought that people would think I didn't know what I was talking about or I was incompetent, um, wasn't the expert in what I was talking about mm -hmm. was terrifying because um, I, I worked really hard to gain expertise and to try to be good at my job that the inability or what I perceived as the inability to convey that, um, yeah, it was petrifying because it meant so much to me. And I, there was a, um, a series of speaking engagements that I was going to have to do at work. I was asked to do um, over a year's time about 10 different presentations at various places around the country. Um, and while I was excited about being asked to do it, I considered quitting my job because the thought of speaking in front of that many people that many times was just the worst thing in the world. Um, so th through therapy, I was able to develop a plan. Um, we, we kind of took it step by step. The first step, show up no matter what happens, stutter, not stutter, avoid, use tricks, it doesn't matter, just be there. Um, and it, from there, just kind of developed a plan to slowly get my stuttering out there more and eventually, you know, open stutter in front of 100 people, 150 people. Um, and rather than thinking about using tricks or trying to appear fluent, being able to think about my content and you know, other ways to engage the audience and things like that. Um, so yeah, so just the, the thought two years ago of speaking and stuttering in front of 150 people was not, it wasn't an option, um, but now it's, you know, I've done it, so. Yeah. You kind of make it sound easy. 
Definitely not easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not easy, but you know, to get from point A to point B, there's you know six different sub steps in there. So taking it one step at a time. Like I said, the first step showing up. You know, it's hard on its own, but from there you can build on that. You've shown up once. Now I can show one disfluency or you know a word that I would normally substitute. Say that word, no matter what happens. Um, so while it's certainly not easy. This big problem in front of you by breaking it down into smaller problems does make it surmountable. It's interesting you say can't because what I learned going through avoidance detection therapy was there's no actual can't. There's a not willing to. It's not that I can't do that. It's that I'm not willing to do that. It's not that I'm, it's not that I can't make that phone call and stutter while doing it. It's that I'm not willing to do that. And so the thing that avoidance detection therapy helped me was being willing to do it. And when I started the therapy, I started making phone calls, and they were pretty much as bad as I thought they would be. I would call someone up and say, hello, this is Kevin Clark returning your call, or something like that, maybe worse than that. And I did that enough times that I realized it wasn't going to kill me. And oddly enough, at the end of the phone call, after I had given the client whatever information they wanted, they thanked me. Well, if they thanked me, then I did okay with it, right? Because I gave them the information that they wanted. It's also that it challenges you to do, um, uh, to, to, to face your fears the three t t times a day. And just anybody um, uh, stuttering or s somebody that doesn't actually stutter too could could benefit from that type of ch challenge if everybody um, I did s s something that Help them back three t times a day. I th think that th they too would would grow exponentially too. About the fear hierarchy, and for me, I had presentations and talking to women, mm -hmm. right? And and I was and. And I started getting addicted to overcoming these fears because it was so much fun. You'd go out there, you'd do it. And so I wanted to, wanted to go after it. I wanted to tackle this. So I was going to desensitize to stuttering, not only in front of strangers, but in front of women simultaneously. So I set up, uh, I, I set myself up on some dating apps and I prepared to go on 100 dates in six months. So <laughs> my Saturday looked like a date at 3 p.m., 5 p.m., 7 p.m., 9 p.m., 11 p.m. And I would organize them so that they were in a location that was close to each other. So I would walk, I'd meet someone at the National Zoo, I would, I would hang out with them and I'd be like, oh shit, I gotta get going to this next date. So I'd be like, you know, I, I gotta go. And then I'd show up with someone else and I was, I was just emotionally exhausted from that last interaction. I was like, oh, here we go again. Gotta introduce myself, tell my spiel. And it was just listener reactions and meeting new people and the, the stress of like them coming out and meeting me. So there was just so many layers. And by, by midnight, I was just so emotionally exhausted. I was I couldn't talk to anyone else, but then you do this a week later, it becomes a little bit easier, mm -hmm. right? And then by a month, you're like, this ain't so bad. And then by the end of it, now I'm out at, at events and gatherings and I have no issues starting small talk with anyone. Mm -hmm. I've grown so comfortable and it was due to focused assignment-based um, practice. Mm -hmm. I'm, at this point, I need to be have a good deal of disfluency, not fluency, because if, I, if I'm too fluent, I'm back where I was, I'm covert, I'm hiding it, and I become afraid, my listener will discover that I am a stutter. I need to be, 
I need to have a healthy amount of disfluency, whether it's voluntary disfluency or not, a healthy amount so that they know I'm a stutterer and then I can relax. Then that fear is gone, my fear. Uh, when I got into my college years, that was when things really started to kind of expose themselves. You know, I couldn't say what I wanted to say. I had to say exactly what needed to be said. I couldn't, um, I couldn't avoid words or avoid sounds. And things started to really unravel for me. And people were beginning to kind of look at me f f funny. And people were starting to see that something was going on, too. Uh, it led to a point for me where I had to disclose and I disclosed actually to somebody in grad school because I was pretty much cornered like somebody actually it was a group of people in the class and they were asking questions and it was only seven people in my class and five people had already answered the question and it was like I was either going to be next or and so and I knew I was going to completely block and nothing was going to come out of my mouth and I had to just walk out the classroom and that was the first time I actually um, disclosed to someone and I asked her to not tell anybody what I was about to share with her. I actually took her into an audiology booth where I knew it was soundproof. <laughs> so I was married for four years and my husband did not know that I stuttered. And people always say to me, how is it possible that your husband did not know you stuttered? So I give them this, well, I tell them the story. Before we got married, I felt like I had to disclose this horrible thing about myself to him. I had to tell him, you know, who he was really marrying in case he wanted to back out, right, last minute. And I remember we were lying down, and I was pouring my heart out to him, and I was crying. I was talking about my stutter and how this is my demon, and I hate it, and it just, it just, you know, c controls every aspect, you know, of my of my conscious and my unconscious thoughts. And crying, and my husband has no memory of this conversation, <laughs> not a second. And people are like, how is that possible? So, and I said, you know, I need to m make an assignment for m myself. This is really hard for, for, for me to, to do, but I need you guys to tell me everything that you want to eat, and I'm going to order everybody's meal. <laughs> you guys got to be in on this with me. The waiter's not going to know, and everybody just be cool, you know, whatever. And so that was a real big uh Point for me, just again being open about it and sharing with other people and having them to be a part of my my cheering squad, right? So I remember the waiter coming over and I was just like, I'm going to order for everybody, and, and he was like, All right, whatever. And so and I'm like, She's going to have the ch 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 ch, and the waiter type busted. <laughs> and one of my friends, I'm like, you let her finish. I mean, they were like so. They were like my cheerleaders. Like people was like started fighting. It was just bad. I mean, you know. And I was like, just relax, okay. And I'm like, Chip, Chip, Mar 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 Marcella. And then, it? and then he's gonna have the. And I think the waiter was like, "Are you kidding me? Like, am I being punk? Like, this is the joke." But the experience I had gotten past all the emotion of it, and just having my friends there rooting me on, and being a part of my team is so important. So I know what I know what that feels like just to have somebody that's close to you to just to understand it. People are like you are recovered. I said, "No, I'm actually I'm on this journey. I'm still on this journey because I have moments where I'll be open stuttering on something, and then I'm like, let me cut it right now. It's just going too long, right? And, and I'm like, there you go again. I'm talking to myself. I'm constantly my own speech language pathologist saying, see, that's what the stuff that got you in trouble the first time, <laughs> and you know, so it, it's a fun thing now. And so um, I'm just so grateful, so thankful that my life." is completely changed. And it wasn't all because of avoidance reduction therapy. The other half of this for me was meeting a community of people who stutter. Whether it be through group therapy, or through the National Stuttering Association. I mean, wow. You just got people you can call, you can touch, you can just hang out with and practice stuff and just be okay with it and know that you can stutter and be free and have a full life.